Hey, can we put our hands together for all the dads in the house today? Come on, dads. It's good to have you at church. Great having you guys with us. Go ahead and grab a seat. Happy Father's Day to all the dads, man, all the dads. Also want to say a special welcome to those watching online. Pine Valley, can you make some noise for those watching on Facebook and through our app and through our website? It's good having you guys with us. It's great to have you. For those of you here for the first time, my name is Jeff, and it's a tremendous honor to have you with us today. Man, what an incredible day this Father's Day. We're kicking off a brand new series today called By Faith. By Faith. On the count of three, I want everybody to say by faith. Ready? One, two, three. By faith. One more time. One, two, three. By faith. We're going to learn what does it mean to live a life by faith. And speaking of living by faith, we actually have a missions team that is taking off tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Team Uganda is hitting the road. So let's put our hands together for that crew. We have had the privilege of partnering with a village in northern Uganda for about eight years now. And uh, I had the chance to be over there many times. And this team is getting ready to take off 18 life pointers. They are leaving, the bus rolls out of here 6 a.m. tomorrow. They're gonna drive to D.C. and then they begin the long flights and uh, they're gonna get in northern Uganda where we're gonna be doing a lot of amazing things. There's a village called Lagutu and I wanna tell you kind of what these guys are gonna be doing so you can be praying for them. They're gonna go there. A little while back, several of the teachers in this village had their huts burned down and so they're gonna go help rebuild the huts for these teachers. They have a medical clinic that they're gonna hold there's gonna be a three-night gospel crusade. Then they're gonna be doing baptisms. And let me just tell you guys, you may not realize this, but you are making an impact in this village. When we started this partnership, we realized there was a lack of education. There was no church. And uh, we discovered that if we paid the teacher's salary, the kids could go to school. And if the kids could go to school, they could get meals. You are feeding over 800 kids every single day through our partnership with this, uh, with this village. And so just want you to know that. So when our team gets over there, they're going to... They're gonna be loving these kids and loving these people on your behalf. And I want, you to, I want you to be a part of this. I want you to be praying. We have a team of 18. It is three guys and 15 ladies. So however you feel led to pray for that crew, they would appreciate it. So be sure to do that. Matter of fact, why don't we do this? Let's, let's pray right now. We'll pray for this team. We'll pray for this message. And we'll ask God to speak to each of us in this time. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you, Lord, that we get to be a part of impacting our community. But even more than that, we get to be a part of transforming the world. God, thank you for, for the generosity that makes trips like this possible. God, I pray over this medical clinic. I think about these folks and how for many of them, this is the only time this year they'll see a doctor. Thank you that we get to be a part of making that happen. The kids that are being fed, the huts that are being rebuilt. Lord, I pray for your protection over this team. But I pray that you would allow them to feel as if they are fulfilling the very purpose you've called them to. And we'll pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Well, those of you that braved the rain to come on in, it's good to have you guys with us. And, uh, you know, it seems like we can't escape that thing. We, we got rained out last weekend on Pack the Point, moved some stuff this weekend. But, you know, we still got a lot of great stuff. So following the service, be sure to hang out. We got cotton candy. We got snow cones. We got bacon. Hello, somebody. Bacon makes everything better. Can I get an amen? Yeah, none of that turkey bacon stuff either. Fake bacon. Fake bacon up in here. Man, we got the real deal. And, um, and weather permitting, Dane Britt and his stunt team is going to be putting on a show out there. So we dry it up a little bit. Anyway, guys, this is a good day. That's all I'm saying. You picked a great day to be at church. And so we are launching a brand new series today called By Faith. And I want to invite you to grab a note card. Just so, jot down maybe one or two thoughts that, that I share with you or maybe God put something on your heart. You'll find a note card on the seat back in front of you or under your chair if you happen to be on the front row. And if you're more of like a digital note taker, you're like, I don't really do the pen and paper thing anymore. I want to put it in my phone. Feel free to do that. We're not going to hate on you for having your phone out. As a matter of fact, we actually have a LifePoint app that you can download that has all the notes from today's message already in there. So you can be uh, ahead of the class and have the notes already if you open up your phone. But we're going to spend this entire series in one book of the Bible. And we're going to be in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Now, Hebrews chapter 11 is what's called the Hall of Faith. 
And so we refer to that because it, it, it shares little Cliff's Notes versions of characters in the Bible, men and women that lived amazing lives. And, and while the Bible is full of all kinds of stories, this highlights a few of them. And so during this series, we're going to go through a lot of these different stories that we find in Hebrews 11. And so we're going to look at it kind of as if like, remember when you get a, a CD and you put it on shuffle? So we're gonna kind of shuffle our way through Hebrews chapter 11, all right? Younger people, it just your playlist is on shuffle, okay? Older people, you get it, right? And, and so we're gonna make our way through Hebrews chapter 11, and we're gonna talk about what does it look like to live by faith. And if you think about it, faith is one of those things that's hard to define. Like some people would say, I have faith, but I can't really show you my faith. Like it's, it's hard to prove, and we know we can possess it though, but then we also can admit that we've been through seasons where we, we lost it. We, we felt like we lost faith. Some of us, if we're being honest, would say faith is something that's really hard. You want me to believe in something that I have, that I have a hard time seeing. And yet we come to church and we say things like we walk by faith and not by sight. Like what in the world does that even mean? Like I, you know, I just like put a blindfold on and just kind of see where I wind up. That doesn't make a lot of sense. That doesn't seem very safe. Then we, we, we see that the Bible tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Well, I want to please God. I want my life to be pleasing, so I want to understand what it looks like to have faith. And, um, and James, the brother of Jesus, he even goes so far as to say that faith without works is dead. He's like, if you say you have faith, but it doesn't impact the way you live, it's just lip service. And so there's something to our faith. We live in a world that talks about taking a leap of faith, right? Right? So we gotta take a leap of faith, or we even have songs. George Michael, you know it. You gotta have faith for faith for faith. I'm, I'm, old folks, I'm helping you out. I'm, that's for my generation. You gotta back me up. Don't leave me hanging on that. But faith is a difficult thing to talk about. So we're gonna spend this whole series learning what does it look like to live a life of faith. The dictionary defines faith as this. It says faith is complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Complete trust or confidence in someone or something. So let's do this. Let's go to our Bibles, and let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. And in Hebrews 11, it opens up with a definition, a working definition for us of faith. Here's what the Bible says. Look at this with me. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Let's read that again. Let's read it together. Ready? On three. One, two, three. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Does that sound like an oxymoron to anybody else? I mean, think about it. It is confidence. I am confident, but I'm still hoping. I have assurance, but I can't see it and I can't show you. And so, as I said, faith is a difficult thing to define. And one of the best ways to define faith is to look at people who have lived lives of faith and to look at the way it's changed maybe the decisions they make, the way they live their life, and that's what we're going to be doing. So throughout this series, we're going to be jumping around through Hebrews chapter 11, learning from great men and women of faith. Now, quick word of, word of warning, kind of caution as we begin this series. There's going to be a strong temptation to hear these stories and to think, yeah, but... They're in the Bible for crying out loud. Those are like superheroes. I'll never have faith like that. It's like they're, they're like this elite team of, of biblical faith-filled superheroes. They're like the Avengers of the faith. It's gonna be easy to think that, but, but don't, okay? Because the thing that is so amazing about the Bible is it's stories of real men and women, real people, real struggles, waking up every day, making real life decisions, facing real life temptations. And, and when you understand that the Bible's full of real people, and these are folks who have, they have messed up royally too. These are not perfect people. I could tell you stories about some of these guys, and we'll talk about some of them, but they're folks that messed up big time. And the thing that I love is they're still in the Bible. Like God didn't edit them out of the greatest book ever just because they messed up. It tells me that God uses messed up people. And quite frankly, he does that because it's all he's got to work with. So for some of us here today, that's right, turn to your neighbor and say, he's talking about you. How did he know? Look, I am one. It takes one to know one. We're all a little bit messed up. And the good news is God can do amazing things through messed up people. And so as we look at this, don't, don't write them off because they're in the Bible. No, they're, they're normal people that woke up every day making a decision. Do I live by faith or do I live by fear? What do, what do I do? 
So being that today is Father's Day, it just seemed fitting to kick off this series with none other than Father Abraham. Father Abraham. Now, if you don't know much about Father Abraham, I'm gonna teach you a little bit today. There's a lot to be shared. And, and Abraham actually makes like an encore appearance in Hebrews chapter 11. We're only gonna look at the first time we see him. You can read the rest of it for yourself. But if you got your Bibles, let's go to Hebrews 11 and let's start here in Hebrews 11, verse eight. Here's what the Bible says. It says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. If you got your Bibles, maybe just those three words, obeyed and went, underline those. He obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. So by faith, Abraham goes on a lifelong journey, not having a clue where the end destination is. So I chose this passage on Father's Day because I kind of feel like, as a dad, I feel like all the dads here can relate to Abraham a little bit. We know that the journey that God has ahead of us is incredible, but if we're gonna be honest, we got no clue what we're doing. We don't know where we're going. We're like, this being a dad thing is awesome. I don't have a clue. Like, please don't write a book based on my parenting, my fatherhood, on what this is supposed to look like. The truth is, we're figuring this thing out as we go. And so I thought, well, just maybe Abraham, who is in similar fashion, on a journey, doesn't know where he's going, just maybe he has some insight that, that we can learn from his life. So let's go to the original story of Abraham. It's in the first book of the Bible. We're gonna go to Genesis. So if you've got your Bibles, it's the first book. Genesis chapter 12, where we meet Abraham. So go there with me, and let's, let's read a little bit of the intro story to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse one, begins like this. It says, the Lord had said to Abram, now time out, you're like, hold on, I thought we were talking about Abraham. This is Abram. You'll get to learn in just a little bit that God does a name change. He changes a lot about Abraham, but he changes his name. When we first meet him, his name is Abram, but we'll get to see in a moment where God does a little switcheroo on his name, okay? So just, when I say Abram, same guy, okay? So the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Now, real quick, we're about to read a passage where God is gonna drive home this fact that I will do some amazing things. So every time we come across the words, I will, I want all of you to shout that back at me, okay? So let's back up to verse one, and anytime we come across I will, that's your line, okay? So, Genesis 12, verse one. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Great job. All right, hang with me. Verse two, here we go. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's a strong promise given to Abram from God. Could you imagine what it would be like to be on the receiving end of God's promise like that? God's literally saying, listen, I'm gonna make you into a great nation. I mean, if you're Abram, you're like, I like the sound of that. I always thought I was like nation material. And he's like, I will make you, your name great. He's like, well, I think it's a pretty great name. Thank you. I will bless those who bless you. This is good because that's gonna make people wanna bless me. And I will curse those who curse you. Yeah, come against me and you're not just fighting me, you're fighting God. Like that's a, I mean, that's, that's a great promise to have handed to you from God, and then on top of that, all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. This is awesome, sounds great, God, where do I sign up? Where do I sign, what's the catch? Well, it's one small, one small detail. I need you to abandon everything that you know, and you're gonna follow me. Okay, where are we going? Well, that's just it, I can't tell you just yet. Uh, okay, well, how long are we gonna be gone for? Can't tell you that either. How long is this gonna take? I can't tell you that either. I need you to just trust me. 100% abandon everything and follow after me and, uh, and, and can you trust me, are you in? Can we all agree? That's a little nerve wracking. 
Now, I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot, so please don't point out your spouse if you happen to be married to a control freak. But some of us got a real hard time if we don't know what's on the agenda. Could you imagine you're gonna pack and you're gonna get ready and you're gonna set out? I mean, just, just that alone, like, like, God, if I knew where I was going, I wouldn't know what to pack. Is this like, we're going, is this like shorts weather? Is this jeans weather? I mean, now I know some of us pack differently. Some of you, you start packing a week in advance. You've got a list and everything. The rest of you, you're like me. You stand in front of your bag and you're like, okay, um, let's start here. Shirts, how many shirts? It's a five-day trip. I should probably put yeah, four or five shirts. will be fine. Yeah, just throw them in there. All right, I need uh, socks. How many pairs of socks? Well, four or five-day trip. I probably let's, you know, at least a pair per day because I'm not that nasty. All right, five pairs of socks. You need shoes. I should probably I need some you know, casual shoes, some nice shoes, jeans. All right, well, that's like two pairs of jeans. Underwear, five-day trip. Let's go 12 pairs. That should be safe. <laughs> right? Is anybody, I don't know why. If anybody looked at our luggage, they'd be like, do you have problems? <laughs> Just in case, just in case. I don't know why. I don't know if that's a guy thing or if that's an everybody thing. But anyway, it's just it's one of those like, I, you know, I want the blessing, God. I want to obey, but I need to know where we're going. So that's the invitation that God gives to Abram. So let's go to verse 4. So, so here's what the Bible says. So, so Abram went as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Now this sounds like some of you, you hear this like God gives them this invite to go on this crazy journey. You're like, yes, I'm all about that. That sounds awesome if you're single, right? Sounds awesome if you're like newly married, maybe don't have kids, but can we all agree, by the age of 75, you're kind of set. You're kind of settled into life a little bit, probably got a, you know, nice little piece of property and your house is, you know, set. And, you know, you, you probably feel as if you're not really in a position to abandon everything. Because that's where Abram is at. Life is good. Things are working out. And then all of a sudden, God shows up and just upset his plans. God has a way of of intersecting your life when you find yourself real comfortable, like you got it all figured out, God loves to show up and go, hey, I got something really cool if you're in. And he has a way of doing that. Don't be surprised when God steps into your life and starts messing with your plans. So to make a really long story short, and there's a lot we could talk about with this guy, Abram. We could talk about the journey that he's on when uh, all of a sudden a famine hits and so he and his wife go into Egypt, but he's scared for his life because he's afraid if they know that she's my wife, they may try to kill me. So hey, Sarah, how about you just tell everybody you're my sister? Well, that just kind of makes a mess out of things. I won't tell you how, you read it for yourself. Then there's the whole Sodom and Gomorrah story. Then there's the whole miracle child that we'll talk about and what happens there. So I don't wanna ruin all that. We're not gonna talk a, a whole lot about that stuff. That's just your homework, okay? So if you're like, I wanna read the Bible, but I don't know where to start, Go to Genesis chapter 12 and just start reading as long as Abram is in that story. You'll, you'll learn some amazing stuff. So here's the deal. At 75 years old, Abram is told that God's going to make him into a great nation. His name's going to be great. Everybody's going to be blessed. By the way, all you need to do is leave everything you've ever known. Small detail. So fast forward 10 years. Abram has been following God. Now, little detail that I haven't shared with you yet is that Abram and Sarah have no kids. They have no kids. And so there's a, there's, there's a conversation between Abram and God with this whole, like, how is my name gonna be great when I have no children to carry on my name? How am I gonna be a great nation when there's no children by which they'll have children, by which someday they'll be a nation because of me? You know, God, I'm not getting any younger here, you know? Our biological clocks are ticking. And so for, for 10 years, they've been following God, still no children, so his wife, Sarai, has this idea, Abram, something's not working between us. Why don't you sleep with my servant, Hagar, and have a child with her? That way you can preserve your family name. Now, before any of you get any great ideas here, all right, this was culturally acceptable back then, not so much today, all right? So Abram does what his wife suggests. Hagar gets pregnant, and as you can imagine, Sarah gets jealous. And so all of a sudden, she's like, oh, she can give him a child. He's gonna love her more than me is what she's thinking. So she starts treating Hagar harshly and Hagar and her son end up having 
to run away. And so at the age of 86, Abram has a son, but it's not the son that God has promised him through his, through his wife, Sarah. And so here he is, 86 years old. He has tried to make things happen. Anybody ever felt like they had a promise from God, but instead of waiting on God, they tried to make things happen in their own way? Yeah, right? It doesn't, it doesn't always work out real well. Well, that's exactly where he's found himself. He's trying to, to force God's hand which leads to 13 more years of nothing. So if you're doing the math, he was 75, and then when this child is born, he's 86, and then 13 more years, somebody do the math, how old is he now? 99, all right, turn to your neighbor, say, that's old. There's no 99-year-olds in here, I don't think. If you are, raise your hand, all right? Definitely not on Facebook, I can promise you that. So 99, let's, let's go to Genesis chapter 17. Verse one says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Well, Abram fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, Your name will be what? Say it with me. It will be Abraham. Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. Verse six, where are you at? I will, good job, good job. Some of you were sleeping, but I caught you. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. So here's where the name changes. Now, so what's interesting is the name Abram means great father or high father, like, like kind of an elevated, you know, patriarch. And, and he's up in age. Now, granted, people lived a lot longer back then. But could you imagine every time that Abram introduced himself, he was reminded of what he didn't have? Every time, hey, what's your name? My name's Abram. Oh, wow, what a great name. You must have a ton of kids. You see, back then, To have a bunch of kids meant that you were blessed by God. It meant that your lineage, your heritage would live on. So if you didn't have any kids, the thought was you weren't blessed by God. So when he would say, my name's Abram, and they'd say, oh, wow, you must have a ton of kids. It was like, well, not exactly. Not yet. I've been trusting God for 24 years now. Nothing has happened just yet. And so you can understand this element that he's living in of this tension. And then all of a sudden, God takes him from the name Abram to Abraham. God puts an H in his name. And Abraham means father of many or father of many nations. So at the age of 99, Abram gets a name change and God re-ups his promise to him that he'll be the father of many. Now go to Genesis 21. Let's continue in verse one. Verse one says, now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, which she got a name change too. She went from Sarai to Sarah. The Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised, because God always keeps his promises. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Can I tell you, God's time is always, God is always on time. His timing is always good. It's very seldom our time. I like to say that God is very seldom early, but he is never late. We have an on time God. And then verse five says, Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born. So can you picture 100 year old? He's rocking his baby. Like there's a, that's something you don't see every day. You know, you, you see that guy in the maternity ward. You're like, oh, is this your great grandson? I'd be like, no, man, this is mine. This is all mine. Of course, I'd be bragging. I'd be like, you can't stop me. You know, you know, it's, it's no little blue pill or anything. Like, let's go. Having said that, I I do not want to go back to the starting line of raising kids, though. I love, I have 18, 16, and almost 15. Love those ages. So so here's Abraham, and and God has has delivered on, on his promise. And so let's go back for a moment to the verse that started it in Hebrews 11, verse 8. And let's just look at this again. So by faith... Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he's going to a place he doesn't know, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. He obeyed and he went, even though he didn't know. He obeyed and he went. If we wanna live a life by faith, we have to obey and we have to trust God. I wanna give you three thoughts about living by faith. 
Here's the first I want you to write down. Walking by faith is about trusting who more than how. If you wanna live by faith, you have to trust who more than how. If you think about it, Abraham had no idea how he was ever gonna become a father. No idea. He had so many questions. I mean, you know, you gotta think, he didn't know, he didn't know what God had up his sleeve. He didn't know when God was going to, you know, take him to this place. He didn't even know where it was gonna be. He didn't know why God had chosen him. All he knew was who. All he knew was who. He knew that God had spoke to him. Go from your country to the land that I will show you. Okay, God, if this is you, then I'm gonna trust you. And then it goes on and says, I will show you, I will bless you, I will make your name great, I will be with you. See, faith is about trusting who more than knowing how. Faith is about trusting who more than knowing how. A lot of us, we, we don't take steps of faith because we don't know how it's going to work out. But walking by faith, it sounds like a great idea until you realize it's, it gets a little bit, it gets a little bit scary and it comes with more questions than answers. I mean, could you imagine, you know, they're, they're packing up everything. Abraham, where are we going? I don't know. How long are we going to be going? I don't know. But I know that God is leading me and he's guiding me. Listen, don't let what you don't know keep you from following who you do know. One of the things that you gotta get real comfortable with if you wanna walk by faith is this understanding that I, I don't know how, but I do know who. I don't know how, but I do know who. Say it with me. I don't know how, but I do know who. So I don't know how this is gonna work, but I do know, I do know who is calling me into this. See, faith figures it out as you go. Let me talk to the dads again this Father's Day. Can we all agree, dads, that being a dad is awesome? Can I get, a, can I get an amen from that? Can we also agree that being a dad can be overwhelming? Anyone back me up on that? Yeah. And so sometimes being a dad can be tough. It can be tough. I mean, there's people that have written books on it, but we don't feel like reading them. I don't read no stinking instructions. I'm a dad for crying out loud. No instructions. I don't read those until we can't figure it out until our, and then our wife reads them for us. That's, why, that's how we do it. But as a dad, isn't it true, we kind of pride ourselves on knowing things. There's just things that dads know, fixing things. And if we don't know it, we'll YouTube it, and then we'll try. We don't like to admit that we don't know things. And um, ladies, I need to talk to the dads for just a second, all right? So can you, ladies, can you earmuffs real quick? Just earmuffs, just, this, just only the dads, ladies can't hear this. I need all the ladies to thank you, thank you, earmuffs, earmuffs. Janelle, earmuffs, you're not, yeah, there we go. So all right, to the dads, real quick, dads. I've been making this stuff up for 18 years. Can I just shoot straight with you? I still don't have a clue what I'm doing. All right, ladies, you can un earmuffs. All right, so what I was telling the dads is that, you know, it's real easy to, no, I'm just, that wasn't what I was saying. What I was telling the dads is that, that the truth is, for 18 years, I've been figuring this thing out. I, I've, been, I've been trying to trying to do the right thing, definitely messed up a time or two, but I've been making this stuff, this stuff up as I go. And, and to be honest with you, if I knew, I think back to when my oldest just graduated high school, or right, he's 18. If I could go back 18 years, if I knew then what I know now, I would have never left the hospital. I'd be like, let's just stay here. This is good. It's good. Your bed's comfortable. I've got this half couch. It's fine. You know, we have help. If anything goes wrong, I push a button. Our first kid, they're like, if you ever, if you need any help with anything or you need some rest, push the button. I'm like, button. Button, come get this, button, come, can you take him? Button. But you're always in a hurry to get home, isn't that right? You're like, oh, we just wanna get home. Just wanna get home. No, 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 stay in the hospital. Because if anything goes wrong, you're at the hospital. It's a good place to be. It's clean. At least one of you gets meals. I mean, it's not a, it's not a bad gig. Because then you get home. I remember getting home and like the, the kid wouldn't stop crying. Stop crying. You can't reason with him. You can't, it's, I mean, they eat all the time. They poop all the time. Poop is not bound by gravity. It does not always go down. Sometimes it goes up and out. How is it physically possible to poop on your own head? It makes no sense. You're peeling that stuff off. You're like, oh my, this is, because when you're new, you're not a pro at it. When you're, you know, like, like, 
couple months later, you're like doing it with one hand. It's like NASCAR. You're like, time me on this one. <laughs> Done. But in the beginning, it's, you're like, oh, my word, and you don't know if it's a, you know, because sometimes they pee while they're getting changed. And you're having, it's just stay in the hospital. Like, push the button. Do you need help? Yeah, I think he had a blowout. Can you guys take care of that? Thank you. Bring him back when he's clean. I'd appreciate that. It'd be great. But then there's the whole, like, waking up at night. You know, there's just, they don't sleep through the night. That's, that doesn't happen for a while. And it's that whole balance. Like, guys, I just, I mean, I, I get it. We have nothing to offer. They don't want us at night. They want mom. They want to be fed. And us guys, we're like, if I lay perfectly still, she will believe that I can't hear him. <laughs> and you know. But then you feel terrible, and you know, it's like the guys, they're like, well, I get up and I get him and I bring him to her. I'm like, oh, so both of you are worn out the next day. That's a good strategy. That's smart. But you have to. You have to, because otherwise you're not helping. And it's just tough, because us guys know when we get up at night, kid doesn't want us. We don't have anything to offer. We just, we're just like the transporter, and, and, and now we have to try to fall back asleep. By the time we fall asleep, we got to go put the kid back, and it's just rough. And then... And then any of you dads, do you remember the first time that, that your wife left you alone with the kids? She's like, I'm going to go out with the girls. I need sanity. And you're just hold. you're like, all right, man. Bro, look, look, just play cool. Nobody will get hurt. You know, you're like, just, you know, you try to put them in the swing. And, and if, they, if they lose it, you're, you're just done. You're done. And you get a small taste of what mom has to put up with. It's, and I'm just saying, it's, it's, parenting is tough. It's tough, and here's, here's the, I wish I could tell you that at some point it all begins to click, and you're like, I think I'm mastering this thing. About the time you figure it out, they get older, and it's a whole new adventure. And, 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 and you just, you look back on those years, and you're like, oh, my goodness. This is exhausting. It's tough. I didn't know. There's a lot of parenting where you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going to keep showing up because, honestly, it's one of the best things you can do as a dad is just keep showing up. If you keep showing up, you're already doing better than most of the world out there. So show up, show up, show up, show up. You know, the crazy thing about parenting is you don't know if you did a good job till it's too late to do anything about it. First kid, your first kid, you're like, I'm really sorry. We didn't know what we were doing. We had a bunch of ideas. They didn't work. That's why we had your brothers, sisters. It's, but I, I just want you to know, walking by faith is trusting who more than how. I am trusting you, God. I'm trusting you as a dad. I'm trusting you as a mom. I'm trusting you as a business owner. I'm trusting you. God, I'm gonna trust you. I don't know how all this is gonna play out, but I'm trusting, I'm trusting, I'm trusting. Here's the second thought. Faith keeps on going even when you don't know where you're going. Faith keeps on going even when you don't know where you're going. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Faith shows up when it wants to give up. Faith keeps showing up. It keeps clocking in. It keeps stepping out. Uh, you know, here at LifePoint, we have a value of faith that simply says when we step out, God steps in. You want God to step into your family, step into your situation, you step out in faith. Too many people are busy asking God for what's next, and God's like, how about you be faithful to what's now? How about you do what I've asked you to do now? How about you, you, you be faithful to the assignment I've given you, and when you're faithful with that, I'll trust you with more. I think the thing about Abraham that we can learn from is that he kept being faithful. He went and obeyed. He, took, he walked by faith. He didn't know where he was going, but he trusted God, and he kept doing the very thing that God told him to do. I think sometimes in the journey, we get confused. We forget. Listen, if you don't know where God is leading you, go back to the last thing he told you to do and keep doing that. Stay faithful there and watch God take you to where you're supposed to be. Here's the last thought. We can walk by faith or by fear, but not by both. We can walk by faith or by fear, but not by both. Abraham is proof that God can be trusted. I get it, life gets scary at times, but that's where we say, I'm choosing to trust you, God. I'm choosing to trust you. I think about when we started LifePoint Church, this was the scariest thing. I mean, I had a young family, and I you know, didn't know how all this was gonna happen. I remember thinking like, why me, God? Because I wouldn't even pick me, so why would you pick me? Why now? Like, where is this supposed to happen? When is this gonna happen? How is this gonna happen, God? Um, how are we gonna sell our house? How, where are we gonna live? Who's gonna be a part of this? Is anybody gonna show up? And over and over, God just kept in my spirit saying, trust me, trust me. You walk by faith, trust me. 
The fear of the unknown is real. But if you want to live by faith, you have to make a choice. Will I walk by faith or walk by fear? What's it going to be? I can't walk by both. Now, most of us are never going to have the opportunity like Abraham. God's not going to say, pack up everything you, you, you have and everyone you've ever known and, and just head out. I'll show you on the way. That's probably not going to happen. It's not about trusting God with what we don't know. A lot of it is about trusting God with what we do know. It's, it's saying, by faith, I'm going to put God first in my life. I'm gonna stop putting everybody else and everything else, I'm gonna put God first. By faith, I'm gonna forgive when I don't feel like it. Yeah, they made me angry, and yeah, the pain is real, but I also understand that God's word says I forgive as I've been forgiven. So by faith, I'm gonna choose to forgive. By faith, I'm going to believe that God can heal. He can heal my marriage. He can heal addictions. He can heal relationships. He can heal physically. I'm gonna choose to believe by faith. By faith, I'm gonna trust God in my finances. I'm gonna put Him first rather than letting fear put everything else first. By faith, I'm gonna raise godly kids. We'll make church a priority. We'll make time as a family a priority. I'm gonna do this by faith. I don't know how, but I do know who. I don't know how, but I do know who. Say it with me. I don't know how, but I do, but I do know who. We're gonna walk it out. I don't know how, but I do know who. I don't know how, but I know that he who has called me to it is faithful and he will do it. Father, thank you that you are faithful. And thank you that by faith, we can honor you just like Abraham. And right now, church, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I wanna speak to those of you that would say, you know what? Faith has always been a really difficult thing for me to, to do, to operate with. And I want you to know that I get it. And I want you to know that God's not put off by your doubt or your questions. He invites it. He wants you to bring it to Him. And if you're here today and you've had a hard time putting trust in Jesus, maybe trust in a God that you can't see, I want you to know that by faith, by faith, we believe that what the Bible says is true. Now there's a lot of historical fact for the Bible. There's a lot of characters in the Bible that we find historical archeological fact for. So it's not a blind faith, but it's making the decision, I'm choosing to put my trust in you. And if you're here today and you say, you know what, I've never, I've never put my faith and my trust in Jesus, I want you to know this is your moment to do that. And I know you've still got questions, you'll, you'll always have some questions, but it's coming to the place where I understand that what the Bible says about Jesus is true. Jesus is the Son of God. And then when he went to the cross, he died on the cross. The Bible records the death of Jesus. History records the death of Jesus. History also records historians writing about how Jesus made appearances and was seen after his death. So it's not a blind faith, but it's a faith that says, I don't have all the questions answered, but I'm choosing to trust. And if you're here today, you kind of feel like your heart's beating out of your chest. It's because God is saying, this is your moment to trust. This is your moment to begin a relationship by faith. And today, I want to give you the chance to do that. We understand that Jesus suffered and died on the cross for us. He rose from the dead on the third day, proving he's the son of God. And the Bible says if we would receive his gift of grace, we would be a new creation, forgiven, spend eternity in heaven, have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so if that's you today, I want you to join me as we pray. I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna ask you to make this your prayer, just in the quietness of the moment. You don't need to say this out loud, but you do need to say it with all sincerity. And if that's you today, would you make this your prayer? Would you just in the quietness of this moment say, Dear God, thank you for loving me. I choose to put my faith and trust in Jesus today. I give you my life. I receive your Holy Spirit. I declare that you are my Lord and Savior. Say this, say, thank you for saving me. Tell them that, say, thank you for saving me. And before we wrap up today, I just wanna take a moment with heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, that's me. Maybe you're watching online, you say, that's me. I just joined you in making this decision. Here's what I wanna invite you to do. Those of us here at our Pine Valley campus, when I hit three, I just want you to raise your hand high in the air, simply saying, I just joined you in making this decision. If you're watching online, I want you to either leave us a message in the comments or email us, info at lifepointnow.com. We'd love to know. And so for those of you here in the auditorium, if you'd say, today, I gave my life to Jesus. I joined you in this, in this prayer by faith. Here's what I wanna do. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand high and keep it for just a moment so I can see it and then we'll celebrate. So if that's you on the count of three, raise your hand up high. One, 
two, three, right where you are, just raise it up. Man, incredible. Keep it for just a minute. Over to my left, I see several hands going up. At least one, two, three, four, just in that left section alone, here in the center. Yeah, there's another and another right here in the center. Yeah, over to my right, several hands going up. Literally front row towards the back row. Over here, yeah, just continue for a moment. I don't want to miss anybody up on the balcony. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I tell you what, go ahead and put the hands down. Can we celebrate together? All over the room. What a great declaration.